So we are in our survey of Old Testament again. Um, I will say there will be no Bible study next Wednesday as I'll be on vacation. Um, but in this lesson today, this is really a nuts and bolts thing. Uh, there's not going to be so much scripture this week. It is a study of what the Bible is and how we got the Bible. Uh, and, and not so much in depth in the text. But in this lesson, we'll learn about the Bible canon. Um, what is our Bible? That is the 66 books that we consider canonical. We'll talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to talk about inspiration of the Bible. And really, rather than talking about all the different theories of canon, all the different theories of inspiration and so forth, I'm going to tell you what we evangelicals generally believe um, uh, and about the Bible inspiration. Then we're going to talk about the process of Bible transmission from the time that the words were originally spoken uh, to the time that they were written down on parchment or, or, or whatever, and then uh, copied by hand until they come to us in the, the printed Bible that we have. Then hermeneutics, I'm going to give you a 50 cent word. Uh, hermeneutics is how do we know what the Bible means? Can we make sense of the Bible text? And so that's an ambitious lesson, so we got to move quickly here. Uh, what does the term Bible canon mean? You may know when I say the canon of Scripture, the rule of truth. The rule of truth, yes, that's, that sounds like a definition. It comes from the Greek term canon. Uh, so that is directly a, a Greek word. And what a canon was, was a reed or measuring stick. And they had a measuring stick that I, get, I presume every village would have that was a standard for a meter. We have, a meter comes from the Greek. A meter is a Greek word. And so they had the canon, the standard for what one meter was uh, when they would measure things. And so to give you an idea of canons, you may recognize, you should not recognize, I don't think this crowd would recognize, I think in three years I've had one, one or two students recognize this person. Um, and one girl said, doesn't he have something to do with Star Wars? And I was like, yes, I met this man. His name is Pablo Hildalgo. And we were in Novato, or no, no, Petaluma. We were in Petaluma when I lived in Northern California. Now, Petaluma is where, um, oh, what was the name of the movie? There was a movie that uh, that Happy Days was based on, and, and Richie Cunningham, uh, uh, um, I can't remember the name of that movie, but it was shot in Petaluma. That's where George Lucas is from. George Lucas did uh, that movie. Golly, it's on the tip of my brain. American Graffiti, yes. American Graffiti. And George Lucas, that was his first big hit. He's from Petaluma, grew up there. Uh, anyway, so we were up in Petaluma in a used bookstore. We'd taken Ellie up there, and they said, oh, Pablo Hidalgo is going to be here in a little bit, and he's going to lecture. And had didn't know who he was, but we knew he was related to Star Wars. So Ellie's a Star Wars fan, so we listened. And he is, he was an author who has been hired by Disney, and he is on the committee now that Disney has bought everything Star Wars from Lucas. His committee decides what is true Star Wars and what is fake, what is not. Now, when, when George Lucas owned everything about Star Wars, he let the fans write books about it. And they would write, there was a whole series of fictional books written about what happened before the original three Star Wars, what happened afterwards. And so they had this whole, in George, in George Lucas's mind, Star Wars belonged to the fans. Well, when Disney bought it, they said, no, 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 we paid whatever, you know, so many billions of dollars or millions of dollars to own the movie rights. Star Wars belongs to Disney, and you are watching what we, t you know, what the way we do it. So anyway, his committee is fascinating to me. All this is they evaluate everything Star Wars related, 
and determine what is true Star Wars and what is fake. And so they have created the canon for Star Wars, the standard. This, this counts as Star Wars, and this book that was written and beloved for, for two or three decades, about it, that's false. That is not... That is pseudepigraphal. That does not belong to Star Wars, which I thought it was, was interesting. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul said, As many people as walk according to this rule, and that word rule is canoni, uh, peace and mercy. He's talking to Christians, and he's saying the ones that listen to the canon, that agree on the the true things, the standard of Christian faith, salvation by grace through faith in the cross, uh, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And so uh, the Bible canon is the standard for Christian faith and practice. It is what the Bible is, the standard for what the Bible is for the Christian faith. Well, how did we decide on the 39 books of the Old Testament? Does anybody know? Now, the, the New Testament, interestingly, uh, about 400 years after Jesus was born, um, was the first published list, a guy named Athanasius. He was a, uh, the bishop of, he was the bishop of Alexandria, I believe at that time. He was from the African town of Hippo. He, he sent a letter out. He was the bishop in Alexandria, and he sent a letter out to all the different congregations. And in that, he listed the 27 books of the New Testament. It's the first time anybody wrote it down. And so about 400 years after Jesus was born, uh, we got the first <coughs> canon of the New Testament. But does anybody know how we got the 39 books of the Old Testament? Genesis through Malachi. You ever thought about it? Or something in front of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were not found until 1947. So we've been we've had 39 books of Old Testament a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, were there not a lot of other ancient books about the Hebrew people? Yes, there were. There were probably way more than 39 other books written about the Hebrew people. So why the 39 we have and not the other books? Why not the Book of Enoch? Why not uh, uh, the Assumption of Moses? You know, we were in Jude and he referred to the Assumption of Moses. He referred a lot to Enoch. Why are those books not in the 39? Well, there was a thing, and it's referred to as the Council of Gemini, and that, that is an overstatement. Uh, it wasn't a council. A council indicates a meeting that is called and people come and vote on something. It was much less formal than that. That's where Gemini is. In, that's a map of modern Jerusalem. You see Tel Aviv up there. You see where Jerusalem is. I'm saying modern Israel, not Jerusalem, but... Then it's now called, it's on the coast there, it's called Yavne now. Uh, history calls it Jamnia. That's what it, closer to what it was in the ancient times. After Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. So Jesus, Jesus was probably born about 6 BC, about six years before zero, most likely. So about 75 years after Jesus uh, was born, uh, and had ascended for almost 40 years um, into heaven, the, the Romans went into Jerusalem and sent all the Jews out. They, they forced them to leave. It's called the Diaspora. They went all over the world. But after about 40 years, these rabbis kind of went back and became citizens of this new Roman Palestine. And they gathered there on the coast, and they would meet informally and they would talk about the Bible. They'd talk about the Old Testament. And, you know, most we have now, Christianity has the New Testament. Judaism has, after the Old Testament, they have, or the Hebrew Bible, they have the Talmud and the Mishnah and all these just hundreds of volumes of text because rabbis will sit around 
and they have thought up every possibility of every situation a human being could find themselves in and they wisely decide how that person in whatever situation follows the law of Moses. Anyway, very informal meeting and it was at that meeting sometime somebody was taking notes of what was being talked about. It wasn't even an official document that was voted on and listed the 39 books of the Old Testament, which means that they were accepted before this. This is just the earliest record, and it was about 100 AD um, that they have found a slip of paper from about 100 AD, so about 100 years after Jesus was born, that affirms, that lists all 39 books of the Old Testament and no other. Now that's important for scholarship, for people with PhDs. It's not really that big a deal for us. Let me summarize. It was the Jews that decided what the Old Testament was. And the Christians, we have merely received the 39 books that the Jewish people affirmed as their scripture. Uh, and they are the ones that rejected Enoch and the assumption of Moses and all those other things. Christianity just accepted from the Jews the Hebrew canon. Okay? And I feel good about that. Do you are y'all okay with that? Do we need to call a vote? I, I feel like that's appropriate uh, for the Jewish people uh, to receive that. So let's talk a little bit about what canonicity, how you make something part of the Bible. All right, the number and these are and again, these are rules that scholars have kind of projected back as they think about why were these books accepted as the canon. Number one, a book has to be spoken or written by a prophet, a person that God has spoken to, or a spirit-led person. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, what it means to be spirit-led. Um, number two, four things to make the Bible they need to apply to all generations. We need to find truths in there, inspired truth, that you and I can benefit from thousands of years later. Now, there a lot of the other writings would tend to focus on an issue that we don't have to deal with. And so they were not considered timeless, Word of God. They were very topical, very timely. Um, and so that's the second criteria for can it, for making the cut for the Bible. Third, they have to be consistent with the previous writings. All the Apocrypha, all the Pseudepigrapha, all the different writings that did not, especially, I'm more familiar with the writings from the New Testament uh, that did not make the cut. They are inconsistent. They take Jesus in a different trajectory than the New Testament does. They, um, they, they do something that is inconsistent with what has been written before. And so God is not, does not contradict himself. God does not change his mind. And so if God inspires something to be in the Bible, he's not going to inspire something different later. Uh, and I would say not so much a uh, uh, criteria for canonicity, but just a truth is that before something becomes part of the canon, it is a part of a religious community. And so none of these writings that made the Old Testament were written down by somebody and then all of a sudden they voted to put them in the Bible. For hundreds of years, maybe even over a thousand years, these writings were read by people who loved God and people uh, that were seeking to worship God. And these writings assisted them in their fear of the Lord, their understanding of who God was. And so it wasn't accidental or sudden. And, and that's a very important thing. I, I tell you, one of the dangers of getting educated about the Bible is that sometimes it, it begins to worry you. And there was a time when I began being educated about how the Bible came together and, and got, you know, put down that I began to worry 
well, was this like, was the Bible like a political thing? Did they call a meeting and people said, hey, you know what, I, I want to get James in there. Uh, I'm willing to let go of the, the gospel of Judas if you'll let me have James in the Bible. You know, and they negotiated and they had committees and then they had a big vote. I worried that it was a human process. Uh, but and this this fact really helped me. The Bible that we hold in our hands, we have received from people who loved God over hundreds and even thousands of years. And so you think if if the people here in this room had to vote on a new book in the Bible. Well, we would do our best, wouldn't we? Uh, to try to decide if it belonged in the Bible. I think we would be humble. I mean, I, it's a, it's a, almost a preposterous notion. But we would be really careful, wouldn't we? And you think about that kind of responsibility to value God's Word um, and that happening over a hundred generations of people sincerely seeking. And you know what? I got more and more confident. The more educated that I have gotten about how the Bible got to us, the more comfortable I have been with it. It wasn't uh, when Athanasius wrote his, his Easter letter and put the 27 books of the New Testament, uh, that was 400 years later almost that people, born again Christians, that loved God and prayed and wanted God's word to be available, uh, and wanted it to be correct, had prayed and read it and meditated on it. And you know, they had, they had access to these other books that did not get into the canon, and they chose these books that are in it. There are 66 books in our Christian canon, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. So religious community is very important. And, and I alluded to it already, it was never a fast decision. <coughs> Uh, the, dis the decisions for what got in and what did not get into the Bible happened over, for us, hard to consider times. Uh, 350 years for the New Testament, uh, probably more like the process began after about 1,100 years of Old Testament, from the time Moses began writing things down till they said, this is the Bible, this is the Bible, probably 1,100 years, and then it took another 500 years because they canonized the Pentateuch first, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy first, and then it was probably another 500 years before the Bible was complete. Note, the 39 books of the Old Testament were not canonized that we know of until about a hundred years after Jesus was born. Okay, so that is that is a 1600 year process. That was 1600 years after Moses began writing it down. So it wasn't a vote and it wasn't pork barrel politics and all those human models that we see. This was people interacting with the text, the word of God and interacting with God prayerfully over a long period of time. So talking about inspiration, it's, it's inspiration is mixed into these other categories we've talked about. You know 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture. Now what is he talking about when he says all scripture? New Testament and Old Testament. That's what you mean. Is that what Paul meant? I don't know. All right, remember when Paul lived. About, he probably wrote this letter between 45 and 60 A.D., Jesus had been, it's possible that Jesus had only been ascended 12 years when he wrote, well, it's, it, the epistles, these epistles are later than that. So Jesus had probably been ascended 20 years. How many New Testament Bible books were, were written and in rotation 20 years after Jesus' death? I don't know. Probably none. So what's he talking about when he says all scripture? What's it? What am I teaching a course in here? All scripture is the Old Testament. And so he, at this point, 
I don't think Paul is talking about the New Testament. Uh, he said that the Old Testament is given by inspiration of God. Literally in the Greek, he said it's God breathed. Now, I, I make an interesting connection out of this. Uh, Genesis 2 7 says, God formed man from the dust of the ground. I mean, that's the that's atoms, we would say today. That's an ancient way of saying the cosmic dust, the atoms. Uh, 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 Star Trek used to say carbon based life forms. God formed us from the dust of the ground. And how did we become living beings? The breath of God. He breathed his breath into us and we became living beings. And so the scripture was given by the breath of God. It was God breathed. That word inspiration in the middle of that is spirit spiros is the Latin word. It's a Latin word. Spiros. It is inspirited. Um, from God. And so why do we read scripture? Well, we are in the process because of our separation from God. We are slowly dying from sin. I'm, I'm talking about a human that is unregenerated, is slowly dying. How can that person get back to life? They're suffocating from sin. They're losing their breath. By reading scripture. If you want to get back to the truth of your creation, why you exist, you need to read scripture. And it's hard. Reading scripture is the hard, a hard thing. That has been the trial of my life. One of the trials of my life is to be disciplined in reading scripture. And I'll tell you, honest, the only times that I've been really successful at reading scripture is when people have paid me to read scripture. And thank the Lord, I am blessed uh, that this congregation pays me to sit around and read scripture and it helps me a lot. And I look back at my life, my times of greatest growth have been when I was hired to be a professional Bible reader um, because I do it then. And I think that it cuts to the core of my existence that when I read scripture, I am gaining life rather than suffocating from sin. And I'll tell you what, people would rather be beaten than read their Bible, a lot of people. And I think that just shows how sin twists. How sin twists. All scripture is God-breathed. It's given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is what we believe. That's what we have faith in the the, the propositions in our brain that we believe uh, God exists, that is doctrine. Uh, God loves me, that is doctrine. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof when somebody is arguing about God, for correction when somebody is drifting away from God, and instruction in righteousness, how to live a righteous life that the man of God may be complete that the person who loves God may live to the purpose that they were created to live, thoroughly equipped for every good work that is practiced, faith and practice. And so the Bible is inspired by God for instruction in faith and practice. Now, lots of theories of how God inspires. I'm going to tell you, as I said, I'm going to, and it's a 50 cent word, I'm going to give you the the theory of inspiration that most evangelicals hold to, and it is called plenary verbal inspiration. Now that's a, that's a mouthful. Break it down. Plenary just means all together. The whole Bible um, is inspired. When you have a plenary, when you go to a conference and you have plenary session, that's when everybody comes together. So a plenary inspiration is that the whole Bible is inspired. Verbal is that the words of the Bible are inspired by God. So here's the definition. God inspired the whole Bible. Now this right here, this is a modern uh, attack point. There are a lot of people in this world that, that live in mo very modern lifestyles um, that the Bible is condemning of. 
and they want, but they want to have relationship with God. That's, that's as they should. That's as they should. But you can imagine if the Bible condemns your the way you live your life and you're not willing to change. What you would look for is a theory that divides the Bible. Uh, and there was a, a thing, and I don't want to go too far out in the weeds, but um, for 150 years, there was a guy named Julius Wellhausen, a German guy that put together a theory that's called JDEP. Uh, and that what that is doing is noting in the in the Pentateuch the different names of God, and he would say, well, here he's called Jehovah, that's the J, and over here he's called Elohim, that's the E, J E D P, and uh, so those must be written by different authors. And the root of this is that there wasn't a Bible inspired by God. But there were different Bibles inspired by God. And some of them were good inspired and some of them were bad inspired. And so at the root of that, you can pick and you can still have a Bible that is meaningful, but you can get rid of the parts that you don't like. Wouldn't that be nice? I don't think it'd be nice, but if you wanted to be a sinful person and not have your sin condemned, uh, you could go through and say these parts of the Bible are good and then these are for ancient times. This, these don't matter anymore. These don't, these don't criticize anymore. Plenary verbal inspiration. Evangelical view of the Bible. And that's why I say the progressive church, at some point they've left the building. Uh, they, would, they would hold to... Um, the partial inspiration of the Bible because there's parts in there they really like still. Uh, but the stuff that they don't like, you just toss it. The whole Bible is inspired by God. And I'll tell you, I don't like some books as good as others. I have favorite books and I have favorite things. And then I have parts that I do not like of the Bible so much. Um, but, but, but I do believe that God inspired the whole Bible, allowing for the author's individual styles and abilities. That's important. We know that not one author sat down and wrote all 66 books. We know of about 40 different authors in the Bible, but most likely there are thousands of other contributors between people that have written scripture by the inspiration people that have collected the scrolls, the ancient scrolls together and preserved them by the inspiration of God, people that have taken the scrolls and put them in an order. If you've ever read the book of Psalms, that's 150 poems that way more were written, so they got rid of a lot, um, and they have been put in an order. And they didn't just trip and fall and, well, let's just pick them up and put them in that order, because when you read them, one, one will ask a question, Psalm 27, ask a question, where are you, God? Psalm 28 is, I can't hear you, Lord. Uh, Psalm 29 is, the voice of the Lord is powerful, and God answers. Uh, that didn't, I mean, that, that happened where a human, under the inspiration of God, put them in that order, all right? And, and so we know there's lots of different authors, and we can tell a difference in their vocabulary. We know that, for example, Luke is an excellent writer, extremely educated, extremely literate. Whoever wrote Mark, whether it be John Mark, probably a disciple of Peter, um, they had rough, much rougher Greek. Anyway, but it was they were not writing things that they did not know. One theory of inspiration I've heard of more of a charismatic is that you know, a person sit down and they pick up the pen and then they take a nap or whatever and, and <clears throat> God makes their hand write Bible and they don't even know what to write. So I didn't even know I knew that word. I do not hold to that. I think that's poppycock. Uh, I, think, I think men sat down and God spoke to their mind, their conscious mind. I may have been an audible voice, may not have been. 
but speaking into their ability. He guided the process. And as I say, by the time you read the book of Genesis, it is at the very minimum um, 3,600 years old. Um, so it's been in a process. He guided in a way that the final product, what you read, accurately reflects his message. Now, this is an important thing. If you believe a living God inspired the Bible, one, one way people try to dodge the truth of the Bible is by saying it has been passed around, it has been handed off, and then sinful people have corrupted it. What you believe then is that God took the time to inspire the truth, but allowed man to corrupt it. I tend to believe that God inspired the text and God has superintended the text. God is alive and well. God is still working the same plan that he started a long time ago, and he wants people to know him. And he is not going to allow sinful humans to cloud the truth about who he is. Uh, that, that makes no sense at all. So you believe that God exists, but he's been asleep since he inspired the Bible. He's been hands off. Uh, and that does not make sense to me. So what is the implication of plenary verbal inspiration if it is true that the Bible is the word of God and that it is trustworthy, not only trustworthy, if it's the word of God, it's authoritative. And it don't matter if you like it. It don't matter if you agree with it. It don't matter if it hurts your feelings. You are still bound by virtue of the God being the creator that created you, and he has inspired a word to tell you the truth, it has authority in your life. Uh, and we are called to understand it and do our best to keep it. Um, and that's a hard process too. That's why we have Bible study every week. Uh, so textual transmission. What I mean by that, when was stuff written and how was it handed down? This is just a chart to give you an idea. We begin tracking the Bible about 1800 BC. Um, that's how far back Bible history runs. We think that is approximately, and, and you have to understand, as soon as something happens, it begins changing in our mind. Uh, and you go back 10 years, and there's no telling what you'll remember. I mean, I'm old enough now. I'll, I'll turn 58 here before long. And I'll remember things one way, and I'll get my buddy David Drone, he'll remember it a different way. You know, and that's within, what, 35 years. You go back 100 years, things get much dimmer. Even stuff that now we have photographs of, that a lot happened that a photograph ain't telling. You go back 500 years, and it's getting murky. You go back 1,000 years, and we're making guesses. We're making guesses. So we're talking about what here, um, for almost 4,000 years ago, we think Abraham lived. And, and so we follow clues both in the Bible and in archeology. span um, There was a lot going on 1,800 years ago in the world. There was a major, well, well I'll wait and we'll go that, when we go through the, the Bible context and the world that Abraham lived in. Uh, we think about 300 years after Abraham, Moses lived. And Moses, tradition tells us, is who started writing down the Bible. It makes sense. He was trained in the Egyptian schools of rhetoric. At that time, we know so much about Egypt because they had the best writing schools in the world. They were advanced over all other people of the world, and God decided to put Moses in the Pharaoh's household. Well, why did he do that? So we would be sitting here and somebody who knew what they were doing recorded the Bible. Uh, that was very inspired that Moses was in the household. So the Old Testament forms, Moses' writings are passed down. And you see an 1100 year period there where uh, Moses' Moses's writings are, are part of the Israelite community. It's part of their identity, the way they know God, the way they worship God, they interacted with it. And it wasn't till about 400 years BC, 400 years before 
Moses, in that intermediate 1100 year period, all the other books of the Old Testament were written in some form, written or spoken. A lot of them were chanted for a long time, hundreds of years, 500 years before they were ever written down. But by 400 BC, everything that is in our Old Testament had been written down and had long been a part of the Israelite religious community. And so it is about that point, and even this is murky, because even this we're going back uh, 2,400 years, but the Torah, which is the first five books, that's the, the Hebrew word for the pen, what we call the Pentateuch, uh, was canonized. At that point, it became solidified. Nothing could be added, nothing could be taken away from it. Uh, the rest of the 30, the other 34 books were not yet canonized. Uh, and there is a thing called the Vorlage, um, and that's a German word. V, v is F, pronounced F in German. The Vorlage it means something like the first page. Um, when we are trying to get back to the original Old Testament. They, scholars that study this set their sights on the forelogger, what came before what we have now. Uh, and so it's kind of an imaginary document, the forelogger. Um, and, and so that is the goal. I read when I was getting my PhD, I read Emmanuel Toe's textual criticism. He talked about the forelog of the forelog of the forelog. On Christmas Day in 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 20, 2011, 2010, Christmas Day, I read for nine and a half hours about the forelog. And then the next day, as Sarah drove us back to Northern California from Southern California, her parents' house, I read again for about nine hours while she drove and took notes on the forelog. Anyway, uh, no wonder scholars are mean after they've been tortured like that, right? Uh, now, I'm, I'm driving at a point here. I'm trying not to go too far out. Uh, about 200 years after the Torah was canonized, and this is the Pentateuch. This is the five books. Um, 200, uh, that LXX is the Roman numeral for 70. So tradition says that 70 Hebrew Bible scholars got together and took 70 days to translate the Torah from Hebrew into Greek. All the intellectuals of the world uh, spoke Greek, spoke and wrote in Greek, and they thought it was very important in order sort of to evangelize the intellectual world, they translated the Bible into Greek. Now, the, the, it's called the Septuagint, the Old Greek. Um, also about that time, the prophets were canonized. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth became canon. Could, could not change, added, or taken away. And so we have a good portion of the Bible finalized and canonized at that point. Now, for, for about 2,000 years, secular scholars who studied the Bible but didn't believe it charged that Christians had got, taken the Greek Septuagint and Christianized it. So in other words, they had accentuated the parts that talk about the Messiah, because the Messiah is talked about in the Old Testament throughout. As you'll see, as we go through this course, the Old Testament is lousy with Messiah talk. Everywhere in the Old Testament, they talk about the coming Messiah. Well, the charge was, because the New Testament was in Greek, the Christians had kind of appropriated the LXX, the Septuagint, the Greek version, and they had put the Messiah in. In 1947, John mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they, they got a snapshot. The Dead Sea Scrolls go back to around this time, 200 to 400 years B.C., and it was over a thousand years older than the oldest 
manuscript we had before finding the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So we got, we were seeing here about 500 AD, and then all of a sudden we could go back another thousand years and see what they saw. And what do you know, the, the stuff at the Dead Sea Scrolls were copied from the Forlaga, and the Hebrew that was similar to the Forlaga was more messianic than the Greek Septuagint. Okay, now process that a minute. What that meant is, as the, as the Jews reacted to Jesus' birth and began copying the Hebrew manuscript that we had, they were plucking out the Messiah. And they were trying to make it look like the, the Hebrew version tried to make it look like King David was the Messiah. And that in fact, the Greek Septuagint was a, having much more Messian, Messiah in it than the Hebrew version was a more accurate representation of the Bible of 400 BC that was from, from Moses. Okay, that matters to me. <laughs> that, that, that's a lot to think about. Uh, but Jesus was God's plan all along. And, and scholarship, in my opinion, confirms that. It was af after Jesus uh, had ascended that the writings called the Ketuvim were canonized, maybe at Gemnia. That's the first record we have of that canon. So giving you an idea of how we got the Old Testament. Uh, the goal of interpretation, when we read the Old Testament, we want to find what the original human author intended to mean, intended to say. Okay? Now, in our lifetime, we have been heavily influenced by postmodernism. Postmodernism is a reading strategy, uh, originally. It, you know, it has become a life philosophy, but it originally was about how you read a book. When you read a book, what does it mean? Where does the meaning come from? All right? And... Postmodernism is very practical. What it says is, when you read a book, what you think it means is what it means. And that's practical, isn't it? Uh, you're going to understand what you understand, and you're going to walk away from that reading thinking it said what you think it said. And so that's very practical, isn't it? And we see how over time that became, now two people can learn, if go to school together and be buddies all their life, and one think one thing about reality, somebody else think another thing about reality. And what does postmodernism says? You're right, and you who disagree, you're right too. So two people can say opposite things and both of them be right. That's what where postmodernism led, led us to. And it did a lot of damage to the way people read the Bible. If you remember, when you were kids and you went to Sunday school and you read a Bible passage, and the, the teacher, who had probably had not studied the lesson, said, well, what do you think this means? That's postmodernism. It don't matter what you think the Bible means. It matters what God thinks the Bible means. And so our goal, when we look at the Bible, is not what you feel or think about it. Our goal is to find out what that original human author intended it to say because he was listening to God. As he wrote it down. And so it, it postmodernism is practical, and I'm afraid it's over influenced our study of the Bible, but God is speaking truth, and his truth doesn't contradict, and it doesn't two people can't can't have different truths. Does that make sense? And so it's been in the last 25 years that we've come back to authors intended meaning. Uh, more, and we've recognized the importance that we seek what Moses was trying to say. Now, he was speaking to Israelites in the desert. We're not Israelites in the desert. And so we find the essential truth in what he said, and then we are um, bringing it forward and applying it to a modern world, but we want the truth that Moses heard from God. Does that make sense? And so I think we are over our time. I probably need to stop there. Um, I've got a 
let's see. Yeah, I'm about halfway through my notes, so it, it probably would be a good place to cut off. We'll pick up here. I am not 100% sure uh, that we'll have Bible study week after next, but that is my tentative plan right now. Uh, it's possible, you know, as I'm generally, as I'm taking vacation, I, uh, something will come up and I won't be able to be here, but I will let everyone know um, about that. Are there any questions about in, um, interpretation or canonization or inspiration? All this is very, very important stuff. This is the kind of stuff that we don't talk about enough in church. Um, and that is why our young people who are not educated on what their Bible is go out and they get blindsided by gobbledygook and they got nothing to say. And so we need to get back to teaching uh, and we need to get back to seeking God's intended meaning in the text, not what it makes us feel or think. All right. Well, let's close there. If there's no comments, comments, John. Well, speaking of gobbledygook, <clears throat> when I walked in my philosophy class at Purdue University, mm -hmm. the very first day, the professor said, this class, philosophy class, is to get you to figure out everything you learned about God in the Bible. Yeah. You know, basically it's not true, it's man-made, it's made up, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I didn't, but a lot of people lost their faith, you know. Well, or what faith they had, supposedly. You, you, you want to hope that he's doing that to jangle you and to make you examine your beliefs. And that's what you did. You went back and you reconsidered uh, in order to defend what you believed, you had to know what you believed. And we've got to get, we're, we're not in the 1970s anymore. Uh, there is a hostile world. Uh, when you argue with somebody about the Bible, they can flip and in 30 seconds, they can have 10, 15, 20 reasons that the Bible is not true. They'll just flip right to it and you have to, and they're gonna start quizzing you. And so the day where we just believe are gone. You're gonna be made a fool of if you just take it on faith and don't know what you believe. And that's why I have committed the rest of my life to teaching. Uh, and th those, the kids that I teach, I'm teaching you what I teach my kids in Old Testament, and they are astonished. Uh, and the kids that love God, love Jesus, they are so pleased to hear that their Bible is true, <laughs> you know, because they, they've been questioned. And they didn't know what to say. Um, but the Bible is true and it is defendable. And, you know, we, we cannot get to God by intellect. Nobody can think their way into heaven. At some point, you have to jump beyond what you can understand and believe that God is there, like we talked about last week. Um, but the thing about science and we're in the age of science. We're actually at the tail end of the age of science. I think science is going out because science, uh, people want to go with emotion. And when science disagrees with their emotion, they're ready to flush science too. And so uh, they're trying to get rid of science with religion uh, because those things are too objective. Um, anyway, um, I lost my thought. Okay, what was what was I getting ready to say? No, I don't know. I never read minds. Okay, well, uh, it must be the place to quit right there. Um, the Bible is true, uh, and oh, what I was going to say is that people science is based on uh, repeated patterns. We study repeated patterns, and you bring evidence. Is the sun going to come up tomorrow, John? Yes. Really, the most honest answer is most likely. Okay. Okay? Because we have not lived in the future yet. And we don't know that something cataclysmic is not going to happen between tomorrow, today and tomorrow, honestly. But science would tell us that it is. You, you are on safe ground. Uh, but science depends on repeated patterns. 
It's the study of repeated patterns. The Bible, by contrast, is filled with phenomenon. Can you imagine how monotonous the Bible would say, well, Johnny loved God and he got up out of bed and he went and he made him breakfast and then he went and dressed and then he went to work and he come home and he ate supper and he went to bed and then he got up the next day. You know what he did? He ate breakfast. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. The Bible is filled with phenomenon. God intervening in the day to day and doing one time things. So let me ask you, how good is science at picking apart the Bible? It's almost completely blind because the Bible is filled with one-time phenomenons. Science, not pro or con Bible, it just can't see one-time things. Uh, God stopped the sun uh, for the Israelites to fight a battle. How many times has that happened? Just once. How, how good is science at examining something that happened once? It's completely cannot in any way. Anyway, I'm coming to a point that Science cannot prove God to anybody. But at the same time, science is completely inadequate to disprove God. And could God prove himself? I'm sure he could. God has left it the way it is so that we have to have faith in order to get to him. There is no way to think your way into heaven. There is no way to get material proof that, so that you do not have to take a risk that God exists. And that is the way that God intended. Okay, we'll pick up here in a couple weeks. Uh, let's stop there and say our prayer. Can I make one quick comment? Sure, sure, sure. The reason I didn't lose my faith, or the two reasons actually, number one, I was real, well grounded in. You knew what you believed. Yeah, well, yeah. I was and Catholic, why you but I knew it. the catechism, but I knew yeah. that, you know. Yeah. And the second reason is, I was 23 years old. I had been in the Navy during Vietnam. Right, you were a little bit more mature. And I was older and more mature. And I think These young 17, 18 year olds, they just ate that stuff up. And I, you know, I, I remind Sarah all the time that my 20 year old girl is not set, that she is in transition. She is part little girl and she's part grown woman and to not, not give up on her yet because she, because maturity, I'll tell you what, I was, I was immature when I went to college and it makes a big difference. That's right. What else? All right, let's stop there and say a prayer and go home.